session. I'm, I'm Nancy Aries, Interim Dean of the Austin W. Mark School of Public and International Affairs. I want to welcome everyone who's joined us this evening for the Lily and Nathan Ackerman Lecture on Equality and Justice in America. The Ackerman Lecture Series, which was made possible by the generous support of Erwin and Rosalind Engelman, who are here with us this evening, um, their gift to the school was patient. Well before most colleges and universities brought attention to matters of inequality and social justice, this lecture has been a moral compass about the importance of focusing our attention on the critical role policy plays when it comes to ensuring that this is a just and equitable society. Over the years, we've been privileged to hear leading experts speak about issues of race, religion, immigration, housing, and census, just to name a few. Being a school of public and international affairs, the charge has always been focused on how we can create, how policy can advance equity, even when the challenges can seem insurmountable. So the Ackerman Lecture also speaks to this nation's history. The lecture is named after Rosalind Engelman's parents, Lily and Nathan Ackerman. They were both immigrants whose experience shaped their deep commitment to equity and social justice. In honoring Rosalind's parents, the Engelmans ensured that their work is carried forward by their family and now the school. And it was with gratitude that I thank Erwin and Rosalind Engelman for their gift and recognize their daughters, Madeline Cohn and Marion Engelman Lotto, who will speak on the family's behalf. Marion Engelman Lotto follows in her grandparents' path. She has had a long career in civil rights, environmental justice, and issues of equality and justice. Most often she's worked through the law to make sure people who are underrepresented have the quality representation to which they're entitled. But she has also had a distinguished, has distinguished herself academically at the Mark School, as well as the Vermont School of Law and Yale University. Her article, Pipeline Struggles, Case Studies in Ground Up Lawyering is published in the current issue of the Harvard Environmental Law Review, where she and her colleague addresses the lawyer's role in fights over pipeline infrastructure. It is my pleasure to welcome Marion Engelman Lotto back to the Merrick School, where she had been a colleague of mine. Marion. Many thanks to Dean Aries and Professor Smith, the Ackerman Chair, and my appreciation to all of you for joining us here this evening. That was indeed a generous introduction. I have to say I, how excited I am to call Nancy Aries Dean. I had the pleasure of co-teaching a class with Dean Aries when I was at Baruch and have so much respect for her integrity, insight, research, and commitment. On behalf of my family, I'm excited to welcome our speaker tonight. And I'm looking forward to her talk on community-engaged research and social justice, lessons from the labor and youth organizing. I also wanna recognize my parents, Erwin and Rosalind Engelman, who not only made the lecture series possible, but have a deep commitment to Baruch College and the CUNY system, which gave our family its start and continues to provide opportunity to so many today. And I wanna recognize my sister, Madeline Cohen, who's also joined tonight. As many of you know, and, and Dean Aries just said, this lecture series was named after our grandparents, Lily and Nathan Ackerman, who came to the United States from Eastern Europe in the early part of the 20th century. They were part of a tide of immigrants fleeing religious oppression and seeking a better life at that time. As immigrants, they faced hardships, displacement, long hours working under harsh conditions, and more generally, financial insecurity. We are inspired every day by their courage and the bravery of so many others who have come and continue to come to these shores, endure hardship, create upper community, and build lives for themselves. Our grandmother was a city girl. Having grown up in Karelich, a shtetl or small town in Russia, she had no interest in leaving New York City and returning to a rural area. Our grandfather, though, had left Poland when he was 13 and very much wanted to go back to the land. By the time we were in the picture, Nathan and Lily Ackerman lived in Ferndale, New York, where they owned and ran Ackerman's Motel, a small and beautifully kept motel next to a dairy farm in the country. Having spent key moments of our childhood in this setting and loving every moment of it, 
It's not surprising that I was later drawn to work with residents in another rural area, Eastern North Carolina, who also valued their way of life, including enjoying the fresh air, sitting on the front porch or side stairs, something I did as a child with my grandfather to look at the stars and maybe to chat with their neighbors. At the time and still today, they were fighting the impact of pollution on these pleasures, but banding together to do something about it. In a book called From the Ground Up, authors Luke Cole and Sheila Foster argue that transformative change starts with individual engagement, with people in communities setting the agenda and taking leadership roles. Community-based agency and engagement is a necessary building block to sustainable community and institutional change. And my clients and partners exemplified the power of action. In this context, I met a series of researchers, epidemiologists, water scientists, and others who were key partners with community members working collaboratively with respect and engaged in inquiry driven by community concerns and intended to have their research translate into action. They were part of a growing movement of scientists who are rethinking their role and redefining what it means to be a scientist tackling questions in tandem with communities. Whether in rural North Carolina or in the streets of New York or LA, these researchers are at the forefront of addressing the issues of equality and justice that this lecture series is about. For this reason, on behalf of my family, I want to express excitement about the focus on community-engaged research and look forward to tonight's Ackerman Lecture. Thank you. Marion, thanks so much um, for telling us more about your family, the connection between their work and what is so valued here at the school. Um, it's just great to have you here. So before introducing Professor Robert Smith, the Ackerman, uh, Acker, the, who holds the Ackerman Professorship, um, who will introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Austin Marks and his family and former Ackerman chairs who are here, Sonia Jarvis and Ryan Smith, and many students and alumni who are too numerous to name. In addition, I wanna thank Diana Lazoff, Andrea Hundley, Jason Epstein, Angelina Delgado, who have been instrumental in making this event possible. So, the Ackerman Professor is a rotating position at the Mark School that recognizes the many approaches that can be taken to achieving equality in the society. Among the responsibilities of the Ackerman Professor is organizing this most important lecture. Professor Smith, who is our Ackerman Professor, is a sociologist who combines public and intellectual work. His book, Mexican New York, Transnational Worlds of New Immigrants, redefined transnationalism by vividly illustrating how immigrants move back and forth between New York and their home village in Pueblo, a pattern very different than that of the grandparents of Marianne Engelman Lotto. Smith leads the DACA Access Project, a service evaluation and research project that sought to legalize at least a thousand new people via DACA and DAPA, and established a 10-year follow-up on the long-term effects of having and gaining legal status. He was an expert witness in a voting rights trial in Portchester, New York, and in 2019, the lead author on an amica brief to the US Supreme Court case on DACA. Throughout the pandemic, Professor Smith has worked closely with, an immigrant organiza with immigrant organizations analyzing how they've been impacted, how it has impacted the well being of immigrants and their families. Professor Smith, I welcome you to introduce tonight's speaker, Veronica Terriquez. Thank you, Dean Aries. I really appreciate your very kind introduction, and I'm delighted to have. The Engelmans here again, and to have um, the Marxes with us as well, and the former um, speakers, the former Ackerman chairs. So I'm, I'm delighted you all came to hear uh, Veronica, and you won't be disappointed. Um, so I'll give the the the, the, a, the standard sort of introduction, and then a more personal introduction. Um, so Veronica Tariquez is the director of the UCLA Chicano Studies Center. Um, and she has appointments in the Cesar Chavez Department, uh, Department of Chicano and Central American Studies and in the Urban Planning Department. She's trained as a sociologist 
Um, she's gotten grants from almost everybody. I think there's only a few stragglers who haven't funded you yet, but I'm sure they'll come in, in line soon. She's published in the American Sociological Review, Social Science and Medicine, Gender and Society, um, and she's done over 50 um, reports and other publications on community-based work. Um, and these reports don't give you a lot of academic juice, but they get work done and they get that work into the hands of policymakers and community members who can use it. Um, and so I'd known Veronica for a long time uh, and I knew she was one of the scholars that was really trying to put their work to use in the world. But then I was on, I was on a, a committee for public sociology and I got these letters from her. I was like, wow, she's so modest. She never tells me about any of the awesome things that she's been doing. Um, and I realized that this, she was a pioneer um, and, 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 a, and a, a very effective pioneer in, in, the, in a trifecta that is really not supported in American uh, higher education, which is combining cutting ed edge research with student engagement and development in the field and community empowerment. It's a very difficult trifecta to carry off because the main thing you get you get rewarded for is just publishing articles or books. And Veronica does plenty of that, but she also does all this extra work. And um, I'm delighted she could speak for us speak tonight because these are key priorities of our new president, uh, President Wu and our provost, Provost Essig. And I think it's extremely important that we welcome her. Um, I'm gonna give you guys one tiny example um, and I'm sure she'll talk about this tonight, but I think um, it would be, it, it would be, I'd be remiss not to say this. So she's was the lead in the Central Valley Freedom Summer in 2018, which was a nonpartisan voter registration project that recruited local students from, from UC Merced and, uh, and Santa Cruz um, and got them to do registration with low propensity voters. And what this means is this, I've been in political campaigns. If you are not a prime voter, they ignore you. If you haven't voted in the last three elections, nobody's gonna call you, nobody's gonna send you anything. So she did, she went after the high hanging fruit. She went after the people that could, where no one had ever talked to because that's why these communities are not, one of the reasons they're, they're being marginalized. And I think um, she has done this by tying it in with her students with the 1964 Freedom Summer, and she's published a piece on it, the political socialization, socialization of Latinx youth in, in a conservative political context. Um, the, the voter registration was done in the Central Valley, and she'll tell you more about whose district she was organizing in. Um, and the students were kind of awesome because when they got pushback from the local um, the local school boards and authorities about not wanting to register students there, they went and got resolutions passed promoting voter registration. I was like, all right, you got And so one of the key things that Veronica and her work and her team have done is to create the social infrastructure for continued change. It's not go in, get the data, register some people, it's to build something. And this is something that a North that American academia has not invested in for a long time and has not invested enough in. And that was why I was so pleased to invite Veronica to be the Ackerman lecturer this fall. So without any further, uh, um, any further remarks or enthusiasm from me, I will, I will pass the baton to Veronica Tariquez and thank you again for agreeing to be our Ackerman lecturer. And I am gonna mute myself now, but um, I, it really is, uh, it's awesome to have you here, Veronica. Uh, I, I had hoped it to be in person, but some, some other time. But welcome, please. Thank you, Professor Smith. I'm deeply honored and humbled by that introduction. I'm, I'm blown away. Thank you. And I, I am so grateful to the Englands for supporting this work and for supporting the Dow Chair. I think um, this is rare. Um, that, that there's such generous support for um, research focus on social justice and addressing issues of inequality. So thank you for supporting this work. And thank you for um, Dean Aries, to Dean Aries for um, hosting this lecture and to Marianne for telling us about your family. I feel like there's a lot of parallels between your family story and my family that also has some rural ties and and urban ties. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm here today to share 
work that I'm passionate about. And, and it's, I'm sharing more of a, a methods presentation um, because I, I think that the work I do is replicable. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, but it's really exciting. And I, I believe it makes a difference um, in students' lives and then the community. And um, it leads to generalizable knowledge. So I'm so happy to be here and I look forward to questions. And um, um, also, I'd love to hear work that, that the audience is doing if time permits. So I'm gonna share my screen now so you can see my slides. So as previously mentioned, my talk is entitled Community Engaged Research and Social Justice. And I'm gonna talk about lessons learned from labor and youth organizing. Because so I've been doing this type of work for 15 years or so, um, and, and have really drawn on experience I, as a former community organizer. Um, and I think there's mistakes that I've made as well as things that worked out well that um, I think we can learn from. So before I get into the research, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about myself and why I felt it was important to do community engaged research. So I'm gonna age myself. Um, I, I wanna share that I grew up, I was a teenager in the early nineties and um, had come of age when the state of California, the state I'm from passed Proposition 187. And for those of you who are not familiar, Proposition 187 was, a state proposition that was approved by the overwhelming majority of the California electorate, and it sought to deny undocumented immigrants, unauthorized immigrants, the right to public services. There were clauses in this law that voters approved that sought to deny undocumented children access to public schools. Could you imagine that now happening now, undocumented children not being allowed to go to school? And, and this was shocking to me um, to know that people in my state really didn't want undocumented immigrants around knowing that people in my family were undocumented, undocumented or had been undocumented in the past. And so this was really hurtful and shocking and I wanted to fight back. So I started becoming a community organizer. I, I organized as a college student. I went to get out the vote. I tried to educate voters and um, realized that there was a lack of knowledge, a lack of data that the community groups representing immigrants, representing African-American communities, representing refugee communities, they didn't have data and information to fight back. Um, they could speak from their own experiences, but they did not have the numbers to demonstrate their cause. Um, for example, um, I, after college, I worked as a community organizer in East Oakland, and there was significant overcrowding in the schools at the time. Um, a lot of students didn't have books enough books, sometimes they didn't even have a seat, and we knew it was a problem. The community members knew it was a problem, but they didn't have any data to show how widespread this problem was, and this data could not be found. And having been a sociology major in undergrad, I realized, well, you know, we need surveys, we need data, we need systematic data to show that these community problems exist so we could effectively advocate for change. And so that's why I went to grad school. I went to grad school not because I thought I was gonna be a professor. I just wanted to create data for the communities I cared about, low-income communities, communities of color, immigrant communities, uh, communities that were struggling economically. And so, I went to grad school and took a lot of methods courses. I learned how to write surveys. I learned how to do statistics. Um, it was a lot of fun. And I 
being a first generation college student, my dad has a third grade education, my mom a sixth grade education, I didn't realize, hey, I could become this professor and teach other people how to collect data that is relevant to the communities. But then I figured it out and I was like, I'm gonna do this. So over the last decade and a half, I've been leading these projects that aim to collect data that addresses community needs. And I think community engaged research has a lot of significant potentials. I, I really think that it deepens the mission of public schools, public universities in particular, because we're paid, we're funded by tax dollars, by the residents of our states, of our communities. And community engaged research allows us to understand what's going on in the communities that are taxed to support you know, my salary. Um, and so um, it allows us to look deeply into what communities care about. I also think that um, community engaged research allows that those of us who belong to the institution, to the ivory tower, to really forge relationships with everyday people and bridge class divides. Um, I, the students that I've worked with, um, some of the, my colleagues that I've worked with come, sometimes come from more privileged backgrounds and, and getting them engaged in what, and understanding what is going on in the community is really educational for them, but it's also educational for the community that understands what the university is about and how it could be a resource. Um, I've, you know, I've been connected to various universities, UC Berkeley, UCLA, University of Southern California, which, which is a private school. And you'd be surprised that people in the neighborhoods of these universities sometimes never get to step foot on these university campuses. Um, kids in public high schools located within miles of these universities also never get to set foot sometimes and don't really understand the possibilities of what it is that they could go to these universities and have a ticket to a better life, upward mobility, um, a healthier, you know, greater opportunities to live healthier lives. So I think really engaging with community and, and really being grounded in what's going on around us really bridges some of those divides. Um, and, and demystifies what the university does. I think there's a lot of backlash against universities these days. And, and I think a, a, a broader public doesn't always understand what we're doing. The other thing that the community engaged research does um, is that it empowers participants. And I'm talking about participants like myself, the, the professors. I feel like what I'm doing is time well spent and is relevant to the lives of other people. And I'm excited by it. I feel like I'm, my time, my waking hours are well spent. It empowers the students who realize that they could engage in research that actually impacts um, their communities around them. Um, and, and it's empowering for the communities I work with because they learn more about themselves. They gain data that they could leverage uh, for, social change or just for understanding what's going on. They get to tell their story through data that we collect. And then community engaged research does what most traditional research does it, when it's done well. It, it contributes to generalizable knowledge. So, you know, a lot, I and my colleagues who do this work, Professor Smith, you know, have published articles or books and award-winning articles and books. And, and we contribute a lot to to the regular academic research, what is traditionally valued in the university. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about my broader research interests and then share some case studies, some examples of the work that I've done. Um, so in general, broadly speaking, I'm really interested in understanding the mechanisms that drive a variety of social inequalities um, in the United States. My research is focused on the United States. Um, economic inequalities, racial inequalities, gender inequalities, and how they overlap. But I'm also interested in understanding how institutions 
institutions like the university and people within these institutions can challenge these social inequalities. And in doing this kind of research, I really want to inform policies and practices that affect social change. I also want to give data to social movements that are interested in social, social justice. Um, and in particular, my partners have been civic and political groups in low-income immigrant communities, la labor organizations, and some groups that focus on um, education and health justice. And so in doing work that gathers surveys, interviews, participant observations on communities that I'm connected to, I've kind of developed three main strategies to do this type of research well. And, and, and it, it, these strategies hold me accountable to the community. So when I go about doing a new research project, I really want to understand what is it that the community cares about? What do they want to learn? Why am I there for them? And so I spend time with leaders, with members asking them what's going on. Um, and in generating kind of research questions for the project, um, I want to make sure that I think through how to collect rigorous and high quality data. So this is what I was trained to do. This is what I got my PhD for. I took all those methods classes. How do you collect good surveys? How did you do quality interviews? How do you do systematic observations? And so that's my job to think through how do I design a study that is solid, that passes the highest academic kind of standards, but also addresses their concerns. And when I'm Collecting this data, of course, I'm also informed by academic debates and research that is going on in the academy. So I also can use that data to weigh in on academic debates and sometimes the community doesn't care about. They don't always care about the theoretical, the latest theory and what people are talking about. They care about, you know, um, how many people don't have access to clean water in their neighborhood? How many people have gotten sick from cancer? Um, in their community and so forth. They just, they want facts. There's theoretical debates that happen on another level and, uh, and I address those too, but that's, that's kind of my job to figure out in, um, in doing my academic research. The other thing I do is that I engage students and partners in the research process. Um, one of the things I want to do is be able to train students to also collect rigorous data that they could use um, if they go, if they decide to, you know, get basic training to maybe pursue a PhD. But as I explained to my students, data collection and data analysis is useful in a range of jobs, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a teacher, you want to analyze how your students are doing, um, whether you're a social worker, a labor organizer, these type of skills, research skills transfer to a range of careers. And so um, they're getting really hands-on practical training. Um, and, and, and the work allows them to link what they are learning in the classroom to real world problems of people that they get to meet. And um, I think, in, in, in engaging the students in the research, I also learn a lot. I mean, I consider them my students as thought partners. And at a place like Baruch, you know, you get a lot of students from very diverse backgrounds um, who with connections to different communities. And they have so much to teach each other and also teach us people with PhDs. And um, I've really learned, like my research is enriched by the insights of students. And then finally, one thing that I've learned, and this is hard for the academics, they don't always want to hear this, but when you work with community groups, they want the data and analysis yesterday. <laughs> They're like, we have this problem and we want to solve it now. <laughs> and you have to figure out how to move quickly. 
And this is where students come in because they have a lot of energy. Okay, we're going to collect 2000 surveys in two months or a month and a half. And this is a plan and let's do it, right? And let's crunch the numbers in three months. <laughs> and so for those of us who are academics, so I'm a sociologist, Professor Smith is a sociologist. Academic research can take a long time and it can take a long time before things get published. So I'm gonna give you examples of times that I've had to turn things around very quickly for the community. And then I have to wait years before the academic publication comes out. And that's what's awarded in academia. That's fine. Um, but you just, if you're gonna do this type of work, you need to move quickly for the community, oftentimes. So I'm gonna share three examples. And I hope there's graduate students here in the audience because the first example is gonna um, draw on work that I did as a graduate student. So when I was a graduate student, I worked as a research assistant, crunching numbers for um, an org a unit on UCLA's campus uh, called the Institute for Democracy, Education, and Access. And they were trying to address education equity issues, particularly in LA, but all over the state. And um, it just so happened that uh, the SCIU Service Employees International Union came up to the directors and said, you know, we want to figure out what's going on with our union members' kids. Um, the union members, the janitors, known for the Justice for Janitors campaigns are working really hard. They're, at, they're winning important um, campaigns. They're, they're fighting for better working conditions, getting slightly higher wages, healthcare, and, and they're doing this for a better life for their kids, but their kids are not graduating from high school or they're not going to college. Their kids are not doing well. So we need to find out what, what's going on. And they asked uh, the directors, Jeannie Oaks and John Rogers at the time, could you help us? And so this is kind of outside the scope of what the, um, the work that was being done. And they looked to me and they're like, do you wanna do this? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so they gave me some support and this became part of my dissertation. I worked with the SCIU leadership, the shop stewards, um, to kind of figure out some questions that they wanted answered. Um, and I went in and talked to a lot of workers before I wrote the survey and I took undergrads with me. We went into buildings where janitors were working at the in the middle of the night. So we would go into these tall uh, skyscrapers at like 2 a.m. to talk to workers during our lunch break. And we did some preliminary test surveys to kind of gather initial information. And this was really fun for me and for the undergrads because you know we got to go into these buildings with high security and, and talk to people and, and really listen. So we would come back tired, but then we had all this valuable information and, and data and we designed with the input of the workers who mostly spoke Spanish with the help of students a survey to really learn what was going on with the workers in terms of their ability to support their kids and through school and also just learning about what some of the challenges were in school. And so this is a picture of the LA skyline. We were in a handful of these buildings serving workers. Um, and eventually we got the union membership and we took a random sample survey and that's the research that was published. So in doing this work, um, we mapped out where the janitors lived and we learned something new that the union did not know. The union did not know this and this is where data is really powerful. So the union, member, the union knew that workers were clustered in buildings and they knew each other as workers in certain areas of Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, Century City, and other parts. But they did, never had realized until I made this map that many of their work, workers lived in the same neighborhoods. They were neighbors. And many of them attended, had children attending the same school. And they didn't realize that. So 
we started having discussions about how SCIU, the janitors union, could be the most powerful parent organization in LA Unified School District. And they started to have meetings um, around their local schools um, to try to figure out how to organize around school issues. And in doing this, we also took the survey that the students and I gathered to kind of give them an overview of what was going on, identify some of the uh, gaps of information, gaps in learning that the parents had around the public school system. We needed to demystify it because many of them were immigrants from Central America or Mexico. We needed to kind of give them insights on how to leverage power in the school district. They, they knew how to organize, but they didn't understand school policy. So the undergrads and I developed, worked with the union to develop a curriculum called the Parent University that the, we workshopped with the, um, the union members and they would come together and learn about how to better advocate for their children. So we did this workshop in 2008, 2009. The union then took the curriculum and ran with it themselves. I did not have to stick around and do it every year. I got a job. I got my PhD and moved on, but the curriculum was left behind for the workers and the, and the, they were trained on the curriculum so they could train each other. So it wasn't till three years later that I published an article based on this work. But in 2008, the, universe, the, the union had the data, had the analysis that was useful for them. Academia moved slowly. But I must say, I could not have done this project without the legwork, the volunteer work of the students. Um, they, were, they were incredible. And, and what ended up happening was kind of neat. Um, some of them learned more about what unions do and at least two of them ended up getting jobs in unions after this internship. So um, it exposed them to a, a career opportunity that they may have not have uh, been exposed to. And then a couple of them ended up going to grad school. So that was good too. Um, another project that I worked on, um, as soon as I became a professor um, at the University of Southern California, had to do with supporting youth-led immigrant rights efforts. So as, as we probably all know, there's a, a lot of undocumented students who um, don't have access to citizenship. They don't have a pathway, viable pathway to citizenship. And they're talented. They want a better life for themselves and for their families. And they have been wanting to fight for a pathway for, to citizenship, not only for themselves, but for their um, communities. And so a handful of stu those students were my students and they wanted to collect data on themselves um, to kind of share their story and, and use that data to advocate for immigrant rights. So I got together a team of undocumented students as well as documented students who also learned from the undocumented students about their experiences. And, and we conducted surveys of, of undocumented youth across the state. And this is one of the first surveys of this population um, uh, that was done here in the United States. I'm not saying it's the first one, but one of the first one. And it was possible because the students were spearheading the effort. I worked with them to craft uh, survey questions that um, were um, high quality. Uh, we tested the survey questions to make sure that they were reliable and valid. We drew on existing surveys and we surveyed 410 youth activists um, and I paired this up with data that I collected from a representative sample survey. And the, the reason they, the students wanted this survey is that they wanted to tell their story. And so the, the, my grad students and I um, wrote a report for them in English, Spanish, and Korean. They wanted a report in Korean. And I had a Korean grad student who said, I'll do it, I'll, I'll, I'll translate this for you. Um, and this report was used by the youth leaders um, to share with elected officials, to share with their community members, 
to educate other people about what their experiences was like, were like, their experiences around struggling economically, their experiences in school, in the labor market, and so forth. Um, and, and I think it, it, it was circulated for a couple of years. And, and one of the reasons that I think it was useful is because I was able to compare random sample survey um, from from residents, young residents in California, to show to compare the experiences of undocumented youth activists and the general population. So this is one graphic that was widely circulated. So it shows experiences with poverty um, among undocumented young people and the av in California and the average Californian young people, young person. So for example. Here, this graph shows that um, you know around 70% of undocumented youth leaders had trouble paying the bills, whereas 18% of young people at the time in the state of California had a hard time paying their bills. So it really showed how they were struggling. And, and, and they tried to make the case for more resources for undocumented students. And so there were a few reports that came out for the young leaders in 2012, 2013, but it took me once again, a few years to publish something academically. Um, I, I wrote about the undocumented youth movement, it helped get me promoted and so forth. That's nice for me, but once again, um, academia takes a lot longer. The point here is community needs data yesterday. Now, one of the things that was really interesting about doing this work with the undocumented youth leaders is that it got me thinking about effective strategies for youth organizing. And, and one of the things that the undocumented youth leaders did was they were particularly inclusive. Most of them were of Latin, Latino, Latinx origin, but they went out of their way to recruit Asian American young people, um, LGBTQ young people, and, and they use intersectional frameworks to think about how to empower people about around their multiple identities, how to inc create inclusive organizations, and how to create a broader movement that thought about the needs of more marginalized, the most marginalized people in their community. And this was really useful for organizers. So I went on the road to share kind of these best practices uh, with other organizers about what, what can we learn from the undocumented youth movement that other movements can learn. And this, during this training around um, the undocumented youth movement, sometimes alongside undocumented youth leaders really provided a good segue to start an even larger study around um, young people and youth organizing in the state of California. And so I ended up collaborating with now over a hundred youth organizations here in the state of California. And I've also done national surveys with youth organizations to, to really figure out best practices. What's working well? in terms of empowering young people from diverse backgrounds, from low-income backgrounds. How, is, how does empowering young people also impact their families? How does it lead to concrete community change? And so over the last decade, I've collected multiple surveys, conducted participant observations, looked at voting records, surveyed staff, all with teams of students. Um, and the students have been phenomenal. They go out and survey and talk to uh, their community members, young people in their own community, um, and just collect really um, useful data that helps, that has helped organizations fine tune how they go about and organize, how they go about and engage young people around policy change campaigns or, um, voter outreach efforts. And in all of this process, 
I've learned a lot about organizing. Like I, I came from an organizing background, but I've learned a lot about how it has evolved and how digital media strategies and new ways of organizing can be applied um, today to help engage young people. And so in doing this work, okay, um, I'm just gonna, so I've learned a lot and, and a lot of it has been because of students. Um, they've co-authored reports, they have shared research findings with community partners, they've trained community partners on how to collect their own data. Um, and this has enabled me to have kind of like a training type relationship with the community groups where I learn from them, but I also teach back what I've been learning. Um, and as part of this, I decided, okay, I'm gonna do a little bit more of an intervention here. Um, I know a lot about youth organizing. I've learned more about what it takes to get the vote out. And I think I could train college students to support youth organizing groups in getting out the vote, but also further refining and learning about what's working and what's not working. And so one of um, the projects that I've led that Rob Smith mentioned was the Central Valley Freedom Summer. So I trained students from the rural parts of California, the rural and semi-rural parts of California, the central parts of the state um, that um, have historically been conservative. They're places where um, McCarthy has gotten elected, Nunes has been elected. And coincidentally, there's also very low voter turnout rate among immigrant and refugee communities and African-American communities. And so I thought this was an opportunity to take lessons learned from my research and apply them and train students on how to organize and how to get out the vote. And we did this program that was inspired by Freedom Summer, 1964 Freedom Summer, where college students went back and registered uh, voters. We did that, but they also collected data. Um, and students registered thousands of voters and they had a team of 500 high school students working with them to register voters and pre-register voters. In California, you could pre-register um, at, at a pre-registered vote as a 16 or 17 year old. So they did this with thousands of voters alongside community organizing groups. Um, and this was a really exciting project for the undergrad who really got to see turnout almost more than double in their own communities. Um, but for the grad students who ended up gathering data and publishing from it. Um, so I had grad students manage um, the undergrads. They took their field notes, um, other data they collected and they're working on their dissertations using this data. And then collectively the grad students and I have published a few pieces on this work. The grad, some of the undergrads have gone on to continue organizing, getting out the vote or doing other work in their communities. And so once again, this was 20, um, I've done work over a decade and every time it takes three or four years to publish an academic article, but they come out, they come out eventually. Um, so this, these community engaged projects kind of feed on each other and they create new opportunities to learn, to um, engage young people and stay on top of what's going on. So, you know, we're in the, we're still in a pandemic. There's a lot going on with young people, with all communities, not just young people. There's a lot of change that's happening. And as academics, I don't think we really have a pulse on, we really understand what's going on. Um, people are suffering. There's in low income communities. There's a lot of mental health issues. Uh, poverty has been exacerbated. Um, on top of that, 
you know, DACA is going to expire for many people. There's a lot of hardship going on. And um, I'm going to be relying on college undergrads to help me figure out what is going on and, and figure out what data could help advanced campaigns led by grassroots organizations who are addressing, trying to address the needs of the most marginalized. So in summary, um, this work over the years has, has really allowed me to hone in on you know, strategies that make this work effective um, and, and really keep me grounded in what the communities are concerned at around, um, really um, allow me to engage students as partners in the research process. They're invaluable and have allowed me to produce tangible results for community groups. And I think knowing all of this that you, know, you need to produce for community groups before you publish your own academic research can really scare away assistant professors. And I must say, when I was an assistant professor, I was at risk for not getting tenure. Um, and, and because I was, as one senior person a, a, a once told me, you know, you're spending too much time in this community, you really need to be publishing your work. But for me, it was more important to be accountable to the community um, because that's the reason I got into this work in the first place. I, you know, if I had, that was my priority. So I think, you know, we have to think about how to change institutions so that assistant professors can feel like they could do this type of work without risking their jobs. Now, there's some important lessons learned for those of you who are trying to do this work. Um, one of them is that it takes time to build relationships with the community partners. You can't just walk in and say, I'm gonna survey you. I, I'm here to help you out um, without earning their trust. And that takes time. It takes relationship building. Um, it's sometimes, when you're new to a community, it sometimes means that you have to um, find somebody else within that community to sponsor you, to kind of show you around and also hold you accountable um, because you don't, if you're new, you may not know everything that needs to be known about how to work del in del delicately and address uh, communities respectfully. The other thing it, that I've learned is with working with so many students is that I have to be organized and I have to have detailed work plans for myself and for them. And one of the things that I'm honestly trying to figure out in this, you know, pandemic and almost post pandemic reality is you know, how can I attend to students' needs? Because they are, many are suffering. We're working with students from working class backgrounds from first gen, they're going through a lot. And um, I ha have had to figure out how to support them through a difficult time, even if it means slowing down the research. And then the last thing is, you know, it's important to develop teamwork and team accountability, grad students, undergrads, the, the, the relationships among all of us um, have to be solid so that we feel like we are accountable to each other. Um, and that's hard in the Zoom world we live in. So uh, for faculty who are trying to do this work, you know, just recognize that we're not in normal times and that teamwork may take a little bit of effort or may take a little time to build the trust um, amongst your research team. And we have to be patient with ourselves and each other. And so that's kind of, in a nutshell, a summary of the work and what I've done 
of what I've learned from um, in working with um, labor organizations and youth organizations. And I've got examples of other types of organizations I've worked with, but I'm not gonna bore you. I think this is plenty. <laughs> so thank you. Or you'd think after three semesters, I would get the hang of Zoom. Um, so thank you so much for your talk, Veronica. Um, I really appreciate your coming. Um, we have some questions in the chat um, and I will read them from the top. So uh, Marianne Engelman Lado, uh, one of our uh, hosts uh, said, have you developed her question was, have you developed frameworks to evaluate the work from the perspective of the community members, for example, the young people in the youth-led movement, that is to get feedback on the work of the students, and if so, what are the metrics used for this evaluation? Not a casual question there. What are the metrics? How are you holding yourself accountable? Well, I don't necessarily survey the community groups about us, but I do what I've learned from organizers is we sit there and we talk about, okay, what's worked well in this partnership and what could we improve for next time? And so it's a more formal way to evaluate. Um, so it's not quite so systematic. But it's also, I, if I can, I think one of the, th not to put words in your mouth, but the project design and the questions are developed with the or with the community, right? So it's not like you've come in and said, "Here's what I need." It's what what are we going to work on now? What what can I help you with? And what do you guys want to do? Correct. Okay, good. So the next question, um, and we only have at this point two more questions in the queue. I have one or two, but I would encourage audience members to please come through with, with questions. This, and this is the downside of the, of the Zoom thing, right? Because there's only Irwin's face and, and Rosalind's yours and mine. We can't see, uh, but please do put them into the chat. That should be open now. Um, so please do go ahead. Um, all right. Uh, the next question is when you are pursuing intersectionality to bring diverse groups um, with, to bring diverse groups within a cause, what do you do to avoid anti-Semitism, including the anti-Jewish BDS movement? Hmm. That's a that's an interesting question. So I haven't had to deal with anti-Semitism, maybe because I'm in California, um, in the groups that I've worked with. But you do, but I think there's lessons learned from any negative type of exclusionary behavior um, that can happen. So whether people are homophobic or sexist or, you know, in California, we have a, an issue here where a lot of people are Mexican and they say things that are anti-Central American. Um, and so I think it's an opportunity to pull people aside and, and say, this behavior can be hurtful and this is why. Um, and a lot of times the students themselves have learned how to check each other. They say, well, I, you know, they say, well, this comment feels uncomfortable because I feel you are accusing me of this and this is not what we're trying to accomplish here. So I think the strategies used to address sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, ageism, some of those strategies could be used to address um, anti-Semitism. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Great. So um, the next question, um, and this one, this one is, sh it, it's, a, it's short, but it's also, it, 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 you're going to chuckle when you hear it. Uh, what was it like navigating the IRB process at the institutions you were affiliated with? And for people that don't know what the IRB is, it's the Institutional Review Board, which is 
formally supposed to be the entity that protects human subjects and human research that involves human subjects, but is widely understood. Let me just say that that's not often the experience of people who are navigating their way through the IRB process. What was your experience like? <laughs> well, I've learned that to get a study started and to get it kind of, to give, get permission to start a study, I generally do an exploratory IRB. I start with very general questions and I say I'm talking to community stakeholders. And that's what I do. I talk to community stakeholders. And so that opens me up for a very general, usually non-controversial IRB. And then I let them know I am going to likely submit an amendment. And then I keep on submitting amendments that get more precise and actually address the research that I'm doing. And, and I think this is a good, at least for my research, it, it, it makes a lot of sense because I often use a, a, an inductive approach. I take what I'm hearing from the community to revise and to develop the research questions. So I have IRBs with multiple, multiple amendments. But the way to get your foot in the door is to start, at least with this community engaged research, is to start with the general one. I say, I am going to talk to the stakeholders about these topics. And it's not personal. We're not collecting individual data about individual lives at the beginning. We're talking about societal problems. And so I think that at least gets me started. That's, that's a really awesome suggestion. Um, and I think to, just to explain a little more for our audience, the IRB gets, the more particular you are, the more questions you get. But if you have, if you say you're going to talk to stakeholders about these issues, it's sort of just, I'm going to go talk to them. And there's very little resistance to that. And then by the time you're getting more, more concretized about the things you're doing, everybody's already bought in. So you, you're not submitting a formal, a formalized IRB, here's the survey, et cetera, until well into the process. That might come six months or seven or eight months later after the study has begun. That's a, that's a great idea. I really like that as a best practice. I'm, I'm taking notes, Veronica, I appreciate it. Um, I skipped a very, very important question from uh, our Dean, from Dean Aries. Um, and this is not a casual question either. You, apparently we're not a casual question kind of a place. We're trying to get business done here. Um, and so, and as you and I, Veronica, when we talked, um, Baruch and Marx in particular are trying to, to really ramp up our capacity to do community engaged and student engaged research. And so Dean Aries's question is, how is the relationship with your students structured? Do you offer a community-based research class? Do students receive independent study credit for working with you? Uh, do you have other mechanisms? So, and, and so if you were gonna advise a public university on the East Coast that has already done some of this work, but is really trying to launch a larger initiative and wants to do it right, what would your, what would your suggestions be? Well, this is the way I've done it. And I'll tell you the way I've done it and then the, how I wish I could do it. So I've always signed up to teach the research methods courses. And in the research methods courses, I led students, I asked students to participate, to take on a research project, either of their own choosing or something that I'm working on. And some of them signed up for my project. I had students help, help me survey janitors. <laughs> um, they help survey young, you know, young people and community groups. And others say, no, I wanna like, do an in-depth study of gender dynamics in the dorms or whatever, which is all great. And so that helps me identify students who are interested in the topics. And then sometimes I keep them on, like if they do a good job in the class, I keep them on either as paid research assistants or they do independent study afterwards. Now, in my dream world, I would be teaching a two, a, a two sequence course one, introduction to research methods, and then two, community-engaged research methods. Um, and, and 
community engaged research methods wouldn't be a required class, but students who already have a foundation in, in methods would then take my course and then we do projects in the, in the community. And so knowing students for two quarters or two semesters is really neat because then you could know what their strengths are. Because one of the things I've I've had I've had to do in these projects and managing now hundreds of students is you need to know what their strengths are. Some are really good at collecting surveys. Some are some you know are great at analyzing data or cleaning up spreadsheets. <laughs> they like the they like that work and they like crunching the numbers. So there's the people who are out front talking to the community. Those that are doing more behind the scenes work or the lit review the analysis. Um, and, and so the longer you have a student, the longer, the better you have a sense of what their strengths are and also what they want to learn, right? They're also growing. So some might want to sign up to do something they've never done before, like conduct interviews and you train them and that's great. Um, so that's what I've done and I would like to do. Um, with California Freedom Summer, we're doing independent study right now, we're, we're gonna do independent study and then I'm gonna do a course, um, a qu we're in the quarter system. So they're gonna do a quarter of independent study to start training up and then a full course on youth organizing for racial justice. And so I get those students for 20 weeks and that'll be lovely and I'll know who they are. Relationships are important in this work and understanding your students and how to support them is critical. And one of the things when, when we spoke that I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit now about, um, and if you don't, it's also fine, is that you have students apply for the course and not everybody has skills that are useful in the community and so not it's because if you have 30 people and only 20 of them have a have, have some kind of a skill that's useful, it, it's the other people are not going to be helpful. And that must be a difficult thing to sort of, you know, parse because everybody has the sincerity of the ideas are good, I think, or the intent. Right. Tell me a little bit about that process for you. So for Central Valley Freedom Summer. Um, in 2018, I wanted to get students who were from the community who could go back to their own community to do voter education and the research. And I was really looking for students who had personal ties to communities with low voter turnout rates. Um, and so not everybody fit that profile. Um, I wanted to be able to move quickly, be able to have students go out and survey their high their I mean conduct voter registrations at their high schools their where they attended high schools connect with community members community college students that were part of their neighborhood and so I had to exclude students who didn't come from those communities um, in that particular project um, because it was very specific. Um, so that's one way I've had to, you know, be very selective. Um, in other situations, I've had a lot of people sign up to be part of my research team and I look for certain qualifications, the ability to speak a language that the community speaks or um, familiarity with the community. They don't necessarily have to be from the community, but they, they need to be able to already engage and not get lost and just be able to go in and feel comfortable and um, just do, do the work respectfully um, in the community. So I so, also, go ahead. So, so in a certain way, I guess it's to summarize one thing, then it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a custom made class because it has to be able, the, the students all have to be able to sustain the relationships with the community organization. And so it's a lot more work up front because you have to, you have to have the relationships and you have to help the students to develop either, they already have to have those relationships or you have to bring them in to help develop those. That's also a part of it, right? It's, and it has to be built into the design, I think is what you're saying. Right, 
Right. And, you know, there's pro so there's different projects that I've led um, in 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 some of them, the, the students need to just go be able to need to be able to go right into the community and do the work. Um, and, and there's a lot of interaction with immigrant communities, African American communities, formerly incarcerated communities and so forth. Um, and so culturally, they have to have the cultural competence. But there's other projects where the students are also doing a lot of work, da doing data analysis and um, data cleaning and writing and lit reviews. And they're contributing to the community engaged work without necessarily having to be the, the Vietnamese interviewer. You know, they, they don't have to have that cultural connection. So, you know, when, when designing a class, you have to think about whether you could have a, be able to draw on a range of talents and skills, or if you are looking for a very specific skill set or a very specific set of cultural competencies. And so that can be complicated. That can be complicated. Thank you. So, um, so we have three or four questions left and I think and we have about 14 minutes. Um, I think it's okay, but what I'd like to do then is tell you all the questions. Um, you can probably read them too, but I'll tell I'll just read my role is to read them out. so I'll, I'll read them out to make sure they're in the record. Um, and then I'll, we will let you respond to them in sequence. So one of them from Lucina Chavez um, asks what the most surprising thing, that students have taught you, um, especially during this time about resiliency and, and their original thinking, or perhaps uh, some other thing I haven't included um, because they're the future, future leaders and she, the, Lucina wants to know um, how they feel. And it sounds like they're getting more and more empowered with each project. Um, and then, so that's a, what did you learn from them uh, question. And then we've got several others that, um, one of them has to do with from Andrea Hundley uh, at Baruch. Uh, how do you acquire trust where English is not the first language? And then I think you've got um, you've got a, another. This is Angie Beeman. Hello, Angie. She's asked the question that I saved as a backup that I had written here for a backup question, where it's and which is not a casual question from Angie, I imagine, or from myself. Um, if you were, let's say, a public university in New York City and you were thinking of embarking upon this kind of work, what kinds of um, institutional, departmental or other changes or best practices might you recommend to better support this kind of research and the faculty who do it? Um, many of us uh, have had the same kind of experience as yourself with, with, with the provost or other people saying, are you sure you're not spending too much time doing all that community work? And we're worried about your getting tenure. Um, not the provost here for me, by the way. Um, and so I think it, it's, a, it's a significant question because if you're an untenured assistant professor, there's a massive disincentive to do this kind of work because it's more time intensive. And you are the, the only real thing you're getting at CUNY, it's more so, but in most, it's less so. But in most places, the only thing you're really evaluated on is how much you publish, right? Um, and so I'm interested in your thoughts on, on that particular. And Angie, I, I think I've summarized your question and mine. Um, and then from the Dean, uh, thinking in a deanly fashion, was there pushback on the Freedom Summer? Uh, that you had to leave some students out. Um, some, I bet those students weren't happy about this. So anyway, that's all the questions that are up and I'm gonna, you'll, you have the rest of the time and thank okay. you so much. Okay, so learn from students. I've learned a lot from students. Um, one, of the, one of the surprising things that I learned in, the early 2010s um, that I wasn't anticipating is the importance of taking time for mental health and self-care. And students brought into our research meeting, breathing exercises, um, 
mindfulness practices that they were observing in the organizing world as part of the research team and bringing back to us, to, to me and teaching me about that. Um, so that was really neat. Uh, and I think it's taught me to be more considerate about how people are feeling, what kind of headspace they're at in when they're in a gathering. Um, you know, I'm from an, I'm not from their generation and I'm just used to working. It's just work, 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 which isn't necessarily healthy. Um, and so they've taught me to have more balance and to be more mindful about how people are feeling and physically and emotionally. So that was really good. And um, so that happened some years back. And I think it's something that I've tried to build on and continue to learn from. Um, and the other question about how do you build trust when you're, when English is not the first, your first language? Um, I've had, a, I've had international students and I've had immigrant students working on my team who are working outside of their ethnic community. And I think part of what's work is showing sincerity and commitment and coming back and just demonstrating that you're getting the work done. And it does take a little time if you're an outsider, um, but at least in the communities that are earnestly trying to partner and to benefit from your brilliance, um, they, they will accept you um, over time once you show your commitment. And I, I think, you know, speaking a foreign language or it's not being an English language learner or being from a different ethnic or racial group it's always going to be a barrier because people don't know you and they think you don't know them. So you need patience. You know, I've worked in African American communities, Asian American communities, and it takes time to build relationships. It's much easier for me as a Latina to walk into a Latina community and Latinx community, and it I more easily build trust. But it hasn't stopped me from working with other ethnic or racial groups. Okay, so institutional practices. I think universities need to figure out how to award and give credit to professors for this intensive community engaged work. It, you should, it can serve, the demonstration of extensive work can potentially count as much as a publication, potentially. Um, so, you know, my, at my former institution, UC, well, I'm still connected to UC Santa Cruz. Um, I think in my department, um, scholars, the, the faculty members were awarded for, you know, showing, for publishing the community reports and demonstrating that there's a lot of work behind them. You could, the data speak for themselves. Look, all of these surveys and interviews were co collected from the community and X number of students were engaged. That, that is awarded. And, and, you know, that's one reason I went to UC Santa Cruz for, um, and was there for some time because I felt like the work was appreciated and, and also funded. I got support to do Freedom Summer. My chair allowed me to teach a class that focused on participatory action research around getting out the vote. I was allowed to get, take that, you know, teach a whole class and have hold students captive <laughs> for an amount of time. And so that the ability to have a class on community engaged research is something that has really facilitated my publications and, and my success 
um, in the last several years. And I know it, this doesn't happen at all universities. I would not be able to teach a Freedom Summer class in all places. So that's important. Allowing faculty to teach a class around community engaged work that they're doing. And if there's funding for research, a research fund for um, community engaged research, um, that's, that would be really fabulous, especially targeting assistant professors giving them court, if they could get a course release to do this work, that would just be amazing. Oh my gosh, that would be, um, that would show that the institution um, values that type of work. I think that's it. Did I answer all the questions? I think you did. Um, and I really like the fact that so I called you a pioneer in combining cutting edge research, student engagement and community empowerment. But I like that we've ended up here at the end where you're talking about, so part of the reason you've been able to combine those three things is that you've had institutional support that allows you to combine them. It allows you, because there's only 24 hours in a day. And so if, if Professor Tariquez can teach a class on this and the students can learn, you are get it's a twofer. It doesn't cost the university more, but you're doing the research and you're doing the teaching and the students are engaged. There's all kinds of things that come out of this instead of you being say, no, you have to teach our intro class this semester because we need someone to staff it, right? So I think that, and, and if there's money, right? Institutions put their money where their mouth is in the form of money, but also in the form of time allocation. So the fact that you could teach this class and that it could be directly embedded within your work is a key piece, I think, of the, of the kind of institutional commitment and the kind of moves an institution would need to make to support this work. Unless I'm misreading you. No, that's exactly right. Here at UCLA, I'm teaching a class on youth organizing for racial justice to gear up for a California Freedom Summer. And that institutional support will probably lead to tens of thousands of new young people being registered and a publication or two or three with the students. No, I think it's a fact. I think you're in. I've been taking notes this entire time. I'm, I'm just absolutely delighted. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes and I think um, I will just close by thanking you again, Veronica, for being, first of all, for sharing your story with us. And secondly, for swimming upstream for all of, for these two decades of doing this kind of work. You didn't know when you started whether you'd be institutionally rewarded or not. You didn't, it's not like this was all set up for you. You had to go against the advice of senior people and of administrators to do this work because it slowed down your production, but it made the work that much more meaningful. And I think now that you are a senior person and the head of a very fancy pants institute at a fancy pants public institution, you're in a position to advocate for this kind of stuff. And I really appreciate your coming and sharing your insights here with us. Um, and the Dean, you can see the rapt attention that, that Dean Aries has been paying to this, because she and I have also been having conversations about how to do this well, um, as, 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 as have other Marx colleagues. So I, I think I will only, I will close by asking everybody to please, uh, you can all put your, Diana, if you want to turn everybody's sound back on, maybe we can actually clap in a real clapping way so that everybody can hear. So thank you so much for your time and attention, your insights, and for all this amazing work that you've been doing. Um, uh, Erwin, did you want to ask a question too, or are you? Are you? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I'm oh, look, and you're getting you're getting a wonderful clap. presentation. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yes, thank it's a you. pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure and honor to be here, and I thank the audience for sticking around. If anybody in the audience would like to get copies or links to any of Professor Tariquez's work, you can email me. I will send you some links to stuff. It's all amazingly smart 
and interesting and you've just heard the the backstory behind it and um veronica i really it's so nice to have you here and thank you for the work you've done and the example that you have you have been oh veronica so Tia, she her ella ella oh those are her pronouns yeah yes. you're actually uh lisa co you are oh. you're, you're actually talking to everybody right now on zoom um so uh anyway so uh thank you very much i think um, Diana Lazov, I think we're we're good now. Is that right? Yes, I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you very much, okay. Veronica. Thank you very much, um, Veronica. If you want to stay on a couple minutes after.